She came out of a violent storm with a story no one believed. A name no one recorded and a past no one investigated. She was manned by pirates and thieves. Her captain was a mystery man named Job. Her pilot, an Englishman named Marmaduke. Her cargo, an assortment of Africans with sonorous Spanish names. Anthony, Isabella, Pedro. A year before the arrival of the celebrated Mayflower. 113 years before the birth of George Washington. 244 years before the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. This ship sailed into the harbor of Jamestown, Virginia and dropped anchor into the muddy waters of history. It was clear to the men that received this Dutch man-of-war that she was no ordinary vessel. What seems unusual today is that no one sensed how extraordinary she really was. For a few ships, before or since, have unloaded a more momentous cargo. From whence did this ship come? From somewhere on the high seas where she robbed the Spanish vessel of a cargo of Africans bound for the West Indies. Why does she stop at Jamestown, the first permanent English settlement in America? No one knows for sure. The captain pretended to be in need, in great need of food, and offered to exchange his human cargo for provisions. The deal was arranged. Anthony Isabella, Pedro, and 17 other Africans stepped ashore in August of 1619. The history of black America began. There were other ships, other Williams, other Anthonys, other Isabelas, millions after millions. This is a story about those millions and the way they came to the Americas. This is a story about the merchandising and marketing of human beings. For more than 400 years, Africa lost an estimated 40 million people kidnapped from that land. Some 20 million of these men and women came to the New World. Millions more died in Africa during and after their capture or on the ships and plantations. These figures, though instructive, do not say anything meaningful about the people involved. The slave trade was not a statistic. The slave trade was people living, lying, stealing, murdering, and dying. The slave trade was a black man who stepped outside of his house for a breath of fresh air and ended up 10 months later in Georgia with bruises on his back and a brand on his chest. The slave trade was a black mother suffocating her newborn baby because she didn't want him to grow up a slave. The slave trade was a kind captain forcing his suicide-minded passengers to eat by breaking their teeth, though, as he said, he was naturally compassionate. The slave trade was a greedy king raiding his own villages to get slaves to buy brandy. The slave trade was deserted villages, bleached bones on slave trails, and people with no last names. An estimated million of these slaves found their way to the land that became the United States of America. But the first black immigrants were not slaves. This is a fact of critical importance to the history of black America. They came, these first blacks, the same way that many, perhaps most of the first whites came, under duress and pressure. They found a system, indentured servitude, which enabled poor whites to come to America and save their, sell their services for a stipulated number of years to planters. Under this system, thousands of whites, paupers, nerdwells, religious dissenters, waifs, prisoners, and prostitutes were shipped to the colonies and sold to the highest bidder. Some were sold as the first blacks were sold by the captains of ships. Some were kidnapped off the streets of London and Bristol as the first blacks were kidnapped in the forests of Africa.
In Virginia then, as in other colonies, the first black settlers fell into a well-established socioeconomic groove which carried with it no implications of racial inferiority. That came later. And that's how we start our second video on the topic of slavery. Um, by the way, this was a reading from Lerone Bennett Jr.'s Before the Mayflower, a seminal um, history on the history of black America. And his telling of that famous moment in 1619 when 20 individuals bound for slavery were captured by pirates and instead sold to the settlers at Jamestown in exchange for food. And it may surprise you that they did not find themselves in the situation and circumstance of slavery as millions after them would. But it merits telling the story of that first group that came to the shores of this country. And with this, we change our focus. Our first video, we spoke of the history of slavery, starting in antiquity, narrowing our focus to slavery in Africa and how African slavery found itself throughout the Middle East because of the Arab slave trade, and how the Portuguese pivoted the African slave trade towards the New World and the Spanish, beginning the transatlantic slave trade, and the slavery that entrenched itself in the New World, with the similarities that it shared with slavery antiquity, and the distinct um, unique characteristics that it took on in the New World. Chattel slavery, defined by the concept of race, reinforced by this concept that some were inherently better than, than others and this natural order if you will justify the subjugation of human beings at the hands of others um, and this is something whose whose legacy is still very much with us half a millennia later <clears throat> And so let's narrow, let's shift our focus, not to what will one day become Latin America or the Caribbean, but this is an American history class, so let's shift our focus to the north, to North America, to that land that one day would become British America and eventually the United States, and to that first settlement, Jamestown, with that, that first um, group of Africans uh, arrived. Now, at that time, and during the early, early history of colonial North America, you know, as was said during the reading, most labor was performed by people that were indentured servants. And this kind of takes us back to our original discussion of slavery. What were the circumstances stretching all the way back to antiquity that people found themselves in slavery? Either out of poverty, people took out a, took on a debt, usually related to poverty, either for a punishment for a crime or people were taken captive. Right? <clears throat> and during the very, very early history of, of, uh, uh, of the colonies here in North America, um, all of these were true. Indentured servants, people that were in a state of slavery, but there's very real differences. It was not defined you know, by race, it was not heredity, hereditary and it was for a particular defined period of time up until that debt was paid off so let's not make the mistake of equating indentured servitude with slavery and then something funny happens okay well mr hernandez fine and so th these were the folks that supplied the labor to the early colonies how we go from there to the slavery that we're all familiar with that took root in America that had everything to do with race that was heredity hereditary uh, that did link human beings to the status of property dehumanized basic chattel slavery how do we get there and and it's quite an interesting leap as seafaring improved as ships became larger faster 
and able to carry more cargo. The cost involved in making a transatlantic voyage dropped. So much so that people that otherwise would have sold themselves into servitude to pay for that trip now that cost of, the cost of that trip being a fraction of what it once was were less and less inclined what this meant was the colony was the colonies were finding it harder and harder to find indentured servant, servants harder and harder to find people willing to do this what filled that vacuum the practice that had been already ongoing for over a century in spanish and portuguese america Instead of relying on indentured servants, relying on people being sold into slavery. And the tradition was already set for over a century. Africans kidnapped out of Africa, sold into the New World, okay, as property for their labor. And that's how we made the transition from indentured servitude to slavery becoming the bulk of the labor force in the colonies. And now, how do we entrench this in law? Because indentured servitude eventually disappears. And now we either have wage labor or we have those that are, are working at, in a condition of slavery. How do we entrench it? into law because that's one of the things that makes it unique not 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 only do these things you know emerge out of historical forces and economic need and whatnot but by law they become justified it doesn't take long 1641 massachusetts the second successful english colony in america becomes the first to legalize the practice of slavery that means for a good 20 years, its legality was questionable. 1662, 40 years after the first arrival at Jamestown, they decide that whether somebody's a slave or not comes from their mother. So even that was questionable up until 1662. 1664, Virginia law declares slavery for life. Something that was debatable up until that day, on that, that year. 1680, Virginia law prohibits free blacks or persons of slaves from carrying weapons, traveling without a pass, or lifting a hand against a white person. 1705, Virginia law states that all Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves are considered real estate. So not only is there this transitional period that replaces indentured servitude with slavery, but slavery becomes not only defined as being something that is relegated to black persons of African descent, but entrenched by law. Okay. So, some real quick images. Don't want to spend. You can always pause and look at these images on your own. In the beginning, slaves were sold up and down the thirteen colonies. But something starts to become apparent. Some of these 13 colonies, for reasons of weather, soil, climate, have a greater need, are better suited to agriculture, particularly the production of cash crops, and therefore have a greater need for labor, the type of labor that they believe was better suited for that kind of work. So as the years go by, what started as something that was you could find up and down the Atlantic seaboard slowly becomes more and more concentrated in those states that had a greater need for slave labor being the South because the South had all these factors that made it more conducive to agriculture and little by little the North starts to lose its slaves mainly by selling them that's how it happens if a southern plantation owner has a greater need for slaves, they're willing to pay more. This caused many northern slave owners to see that they stood to make a profit by selling their slaves south, and so they did. 
until they got to the point that slavery was a rarity, if not non-existent, in the northern colonies and a norm in the south. Most of these slaves, they came to North America. In fact, throughout up and down, uh, they didn't came to, were brought to, kidnapped, trafficked, brought to the Americas, were of West African descent. You want to get very technical, you know, of Bantu descent, um, which make up a huge part of the population of, of Africa. They had their own religions, they had their own languages, they had their own faith systems, incredible diversity, okay? The people that were loaded on these ships and brought to this country practiced a variety, you know, spoke a variety of languages, a variety of customs, a variety of cultural norms. Uh, different, some were Muslims, some were animists, uh, or more folk religions. Um, and here they found themselves bewildered, confused, and vulnerable in this strange land. Forced to speak English. The disconnect from Africa is interesting because as long as there was a continued flow of Africans coming from Africa, the connection, not always guaranteed, because we're talking about a great diversity of people, but the, the connection to Africa, the language, faith, customs, culture, um, would stay alive to a certain degree. But as the importation of Africans you know, begins to slow down and eventually stop, that connection is lost. Okay. And English becomes, you know, the language you are forced to learn. Christianity becomes the faith that is forced upon you. Okay. There was a deliberate effort to erase the past, to erase that person that came from Africa and recreate an object whose only purpose was labor. And so we talked about that, right? The domestic slave trade. How did we eventually, you know, find all those slaves that once upon a time existed in the North, eventually in the South? And, and why is it that the South ended up owning uh, the bulk of slaves in this country? And, and let's get something. Of all, the, of all the, uh, the places in the New World that imported slaves, here's the irony. North America was not on the top of that list. North America was pretty close to the bottom of that list, and yet, by the time you get to 1860, has 4 million slaves, the largest slave population on the continent, despite being one of the lowest importers of slaves from Africa. If we look at the southern colonies and what they grew, and therefore, what was slave labor being used for? It's not cotton, not yet. In the early colonial period, you're talking about tobacco. You're talking about food crops like pig and corn. Um, <clears throat> indigo was, was, a, was a valuable crop in the south. It was a blue flower that would use for dye. And then I want you to look on the, the coast, the coast of Georgia, South Carolina, and, and North Carolina. Something very unique happened there. It's one of the only instances that slave owners deliberately bought a specific people from a specific region in Africa to come to North America. Why? Because they were rice farmers. They knew the very complex art, if you will, of cultivating rice, and they deliberately went and trafficked these people and sold them here. And what ended up happening, because they were all from the same background, if you will, it's probably the only group of African Americans that were successfully able to retain a, a, a huge chunk of their ancestral heritage. These are the Gullah Geechee people of the Georgia coast and South Carolina coast that even till today, yes, are African Americans, but also are very aware of their ancestry and speak a language that is very close to the language that their ancestors spoke, the Gullah people. One of the only unique exceptions in the history of this. And let's make something clear. This is not a history of victims. This is not a history of people that surrendered to their fate. This is a, this is a history that were, this is a history of a people that were entrapped 
in, in a criminal enterprise because what happened was crime. It was a crime against humanity as it always has been and as it continues to be in its contemporary form of, of human trafficking. And it was justified the same way. Human traffickers justify their actions today much like slavers justified it back then. Money, profit. Don't think they took this standing down. This is also a history of revolt and rebellion of people in dire circumstances fighting back. And the shape that white society takes in many instances is a result, is a reaction to that. Revolts and rebellions, okay, because slavery is antithetic to the human condition. Therefore, we could expect revolts from the very beginning. The Stono Rebellion, 1739, that's a very early one prior to the existence of the United States. But with the existence of the United States, we have Gabriel's Rebellion. He had planned to take Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. His plan was uncovered. He was betrayed, and he and his followers were hunted down and executed by state militia. The end result, Virginia banned teaching of slaves, the hiring out of slaves, banned slaves to be taught reading and writing, and expelled free blacks from the state. And there's something about Gabriel's rebellion, though, I want you to keep in mind because of its timing. It takes place right in the middle of an incredibly momentous event in the history of the black diaspora. The Haitian Revolution, they dragged out from 1791 to 1804. And for those of you that know, this is the most, this is the only successful slave revolt in human history. Ironically, very much inspired by the French Revolution in the idea that all men are equal. And they took it literally. And led by their liberator, Toussaint Louverture, they challenged the greatest army in earth at that time, which was Napoleon's Grand Army. And were able, at great cost, to win independence. But understand how inspirational and potentially dangerous this event was for those that wanted to continue to practice slavery uninterrupted. And my God, what would happen if news of what happened in Haiti reached plantations throughout the New World? 1822, Denmark V.C., Himself, a free black, former slave, tried to launch a, re a revolt in Charleston, South Carolina with the idea of getting a ship and sailing a bunch of himself and a bunch of slaves to the only land where black people could be free at the time, Haiti. His plan was thwarted. He was arrested and executed. That led to South Carolina banning black churches or the churches led by you know a black leadership and probably the one that's most famous is the revolt led by nat turner in 1831 he led an insurrection in southampton county virginia unlike denmark vc or gabriel's his was successfully launched in as the men were out on a retreat a religious retreat they were able to march into southampton county Kill somewhere between 55 and 65 people. Um, and, and before you start judging them for what they did, you put that on the scale with the crimes and the horrors that were committed on black people in this country. The effect was Virginia executed 56 slaves. Mobs and militias killed at 120 later. This led to the complete ban of education of blacks and a ban on the assembly of black-led worship. And something else that you should keep in mind, I'm trying to keep this as quick as possible, because this in part tells us the story of America's love affair with guns, namely the Second Amendment. And the narrative, the narrative, the, the dominant narrative is that the Founding Fathers enshrined this in the Constitution to protect us from tyranny. And I'm not saying that's not true. But there's another layer to this. 
And if you look at the, at the wording of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the establishment of free state, comma, weird punctuation mark there, uh, the freedom of, uh, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. <clears throat> and to understand this, you have to go back to before there was law enforcement, before there was modern police. Who kept the peace, law, and order in colonial society? You had the military, but they were reserved for more broader military matters. But then you had the militia, the colonial militia that were citizen soldiers who volunteered on behalf of first the colony and later on the state, okay, to respond to and put down threats to the state and law and order. And for this to work, they needed to have the right to own guns because quite often they had to supply their own. So where are you getting that? Easy. In addition to the official narrative, which many of us use to justify the existence of the Second Amendment, that this was to combat tyranny, we have to look at the more grounded second layer. White men needed the legal right to bear arms so that white men could form white militias and essentially perform two functions in the preservation of white superiority, to put down slave revolts and to put down any native challenges against white society wanting to steal Native American land. So that second layer that expands our love affair is that we needed white, white society needed a legal guarantee to own guns to form white militias so they could violently, with deadly force, put down slave revolts and take land away from Native Americans. And that's uncomfortable, but it is documented history. It is what happened. And so now we're moving closer to the establishment of the United States. And here's another uncomfortable truth. The majority of the founding fathers, people that we are uh, encouraged to look up to, great minds, if you will, were slave owners. They spoke of liberty. They spoke of freedom. They spoke of the rights of man. They spoke of all men being created equal, and yet they denied this to millions. And how is this possible? Because you have to buy into an ideology that only certain people are human beings and deserving of liberty and rights and others are not because they are not human beings. That is the only way you could pull off this great grand contradiction. So when Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain and inalienable rights. And among those are the right to life, liberty, and property. Understand that in his mind, when he says all men, he and his compatriots are only thinking of white Anglo-Saxon men. Perhaps more broadly, white European men. They are not thinking of people of African descent, which they consider to be property. And this property is protected, for example, by the Fifth Amendment, which mentions due process. But also Native Americans, the Constitution itself refers to as savages. So these are uncomfortable truths that we need to wrestle with before moving forward. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner and even fathered children with his slaves. And in the dynamic, the power dynamic of slave and master, there's no other way to do this than via rape. It may not be violent rape, but when one of the two parties does not have the option of saying no because they do not have agency, then it is something that happens under the condition of duress by definition rape. That's the only other definition it has.
George Washington, the father of this country, also had slaves. They were Virginians. Okay? He had many slaves. And he was known to be a very harsh slave driver. Much of his fortune was based on slavery. George Washington, upon becoming president, aware that Philadelphia would not allow slaves in Philadelphia, and if they were there for too long, they would have to be freed, purposely rotated his slaves between Philadelphia and Mount Vernon so that they could keep their slave status and he would not have to free them. And by the way, that's a picture of Hercules, who was uh, George Washington's personal cook. For a while, they took to naming slaves after figures in Greek mythology. But do not despair. Just like there were slavers among the founding fathers, there were men that felt differently. Benjamin Franklin from Massachusetts. You're going to find most of them in the North. An early abolitionist. He did not make his. He was not a planter. He was a newspaper man. That's how he made his money. And much older than the other guys. Hey, but don't forget. He ran tons of missing slave ads in his papers, and he made money that way too. The only guy here whose, whose hands are possibly completely clean are Thomas Paine. But Thomas Paine was way more radical and way more progressive than the people that lived at his time, during his time. And yet, he had no problem working hand in hand with Thomas Jefferson. He goes on to become, first, first he's an American revolution, he goes on to become a French revolutionary. And then we get to 1787. The Constitutional Convention. By this time, if you remember American history, the Articles of Confederation have proven to be ineffective at governing 13 colonies that are threatening to pull away from each other and become 13 countries, 13 states at this time. Virginia, one of the largest slave states, essentially wants to pull a fast one. When the debate centers around representation and that, you know, how much, how many representatives could you state, could you send to the capital? Virginia is of the idea, well, it should be based on our entire population, free and slave. And some other states take a look at this and say, well, that's kind of sneaky, that's kind of underhanded. So you want people that are slaves, are property, to be counted as your total population so you could get more representation in D.C., but you don't recognize their basic humanity. You just want to do this um, to get political leverage. And so, of course, they denied Virginia's request. And I'm sure you know the, the, the whole conflict between the Virginia Compromise and I believe it was the New Jersey Compromise. And then Connecticut pops up and says, you don't have an idea. And we'll create the House and we'll create the Senate. And we're not going to give in to Virginia's demands, not completely. We're going to make a deal. You know, the story of deals, the story of compromises in this country's history. Here we were at a junction with slavery on the table, drafting the Constitution. And with slavery on the table, we could have very easily turned it into a debate about the future of slavery and perhaps, perhaps even a move towards ending it right there. But not everybody was ready for that, particularly the Southern delegates. That was the fear. If you don't give the Southern delegates what they want, they're going to walk away from the table and the union is done. So quite often we find Northern delegates giving in, at least in part, to the demands of Southern delegates to keep the union together. And that nonsense is going to continue for a good hundred years until it's no longer to negotiate, able, it's no longer possible to negotiate with them. So we're not going to give Virginia everything she wants. We're going to give her three-fifths of what she wants. And a lot of times, this it's not incorrect. This is phrased as the Constitution declared a black man three-fifths of a man. Yes, mathematically, that is true. And it, it, it's more emotional when you state it this way. But this had to do with representation in Congress. What it meant was, we're going to make a deal with you. We're not going to give you five out of five. We're not going to give you four out of five. We're going to give you three out of five. We don't like it, but we will recognize three out of every five of your slaves towards your total population count 
so you can send representatives to Washington knowing well that you're going to be able to send more than what you actually deserve. But in return for that, you need to agree to something. And that was the 1808 moratorium. You want the three-fifths compromise? You agree, no more slaves after 1808. No more bringing new slaves from Africa after 1808. And the Southerners took the deal. And the Three-Fifths Compromise was agreed upon, and so was the 1808 abolition of the slave trade. That means, which is interesting because Great Britain abolished it in 1807. No more importation of slaves from Africa. That's done. And here was the idea. If we stop bringing in new slaves from Africa, the already existing population of slaves, okay, will eventually grow smaller and smaller and smaller and then hopefully slavery as an institution will simply fade away I can see that okay there's also some things here you know when you stop the importation of slaves from Africa you break that cultural link you break the linguistic link you break that link of identity with Africa and that's when the real assimilation Americanization if you will of this country's slave population begins. But that's what that was the plan, that the abolition of the slave trade was going to shrink the population and eventually it would fade away. That was the idea. And then somebody comes up with this invention. And that's the cotton gin. And that's the next time we're together and we continue this story. That's going to take all those plans and put them in the garbage can. And this is how we end up with the largest slave population on the continent by 1860. And for now, that is it.